It's 10 o'clock here, so we're going to get started. Uh, thanks, everyone, for logging in and joining us today for our webinar. My name is Jackie Carville, and I'll be coordinating the webinar today. I'm here with my colleague, Matthew Kaiser, and today Matt will give a live demonstration of some of our software solutions for microbial genome assembly and analysis. You may have noticed that your phone has been muted. However, we do encourage you to ask questions along the way. To ask a question, just type it into the chat dialog and select Send to Host. I will then direct these questions to Matt at breaks during the webinar to be answered for the whole group. If you need any assistance or have any questions during the webinar, you can feel free to send a chat message to me, email me at webinars at dnastar.com, or tweet us at the Twitter handle at dnastarinc. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Matt. Great. Okay. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you again for uh, joining me uh, this morning for the webinar. Um, so what I'd like to do today is uh, focus on some microbial genome assembly and analysis workflows. And we'll, we'll look at primarily three different workflows. Um, and I'll introduce the software first with a uh, uh, PowerPoint, uh, and then we'll go into the assembly software. We'll set up some assemblies and then look at some of the downstream analysis tools. So, so I'm sure there'll be some questions. So as Jackie mentioned, you can chat those in, and I'll try to address those uh, during the webinar. Um, and if, if we don't cover something that, that you're interested in, uh, you can certainly, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get in touch with you uh, sometime after the webinar. So a little bit of background for DNA STARS. We're, we're located uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. So we're uh, central in the United States. Our sales team, our developers are mostly located at this location. Uh, my role at the company is to work with NGS customers um, and help them with their solutions. I, I show them different workflows and come up with solutions if you have kind of a custom workflow. Uh, and I also relay that feedback from customers to the development team. And so we use that information and that steady stream of feedback to improve our software and, and continually um, um, make better software for these kind of uh, projects. So I thought I'd start here again with a, a little background. Um, and so one of the important aspects of DNA Star is that our software is compatible with all the different NGS platforms. And so that includes, of course, Illumina and Ion Torrent and PacBio. Um, there's still a few 454 customers out there. Um, and, and so we support these four platforms. And I think the majority of you would be using uh, this type of software or this type of uh, uh, sequence data, uh, and we also support Sanger data. So if you have some Sanger reads, um, you might that you very might well use for things like gap closure in a microbial genome. Uh, our software can handle both that NGS and Sanger um, read data. Uh, the hardware requirements are are variable depending on uh, the type of project that you have. So. The basic computer is really a four core computer, you know, 16 gigs of RAM. Um, now, depending on the type of workflow that you have, if you're primarily de novo workflow, um, the de novo algorithm is more RAM dependent. And so I would recommend, you know, 32 gigs of RAM. In some cases, if you're working on all microbes, 16 should be enough provided you have uh, a reasonable amount of coverage. So uh, we're actually going to have some marketing pieces out a little bit uh, later, this, uh, later this month that focus on RAM utilization for de novo assembly so we can have some uh, new information there. Um, if you're doing primarily uh, alignment of sequence data to reference genomes, um, then the algorithm uses less RAM, it's less RAM dependent, and it's more dependent on scratch disk. And what that means is that the data then is written down to disk rather than held up in memory. And so the larger those data sets get, the more disk space you need. A single bacterial genome doesn't need even one terabyte of scratch disk. It's just, you know, a few gigabytes of, of space. Um, if you're doing one genome. We're going to look at a data set today where we align quite a bit of FASTQ data to, you know, thousands of bacterial genomes at one time. So the entire NCBI um, microbial genome database. Um, that's a much larger data set. In that case, you may need closer to the four terabytes of scratch disk to process thousands of microbial genomes in a single assembly. And then, of course, adequate storage needs for both the input and output data. And so if you have questions on hardware, um, as, as many often do, you know, feel free to relay that along, along to us. Um, now, there's another option as well. Uh, if, if, if you'd like to try software out, for instance, and maybe at your location you've got very modest hardware, maybe only a laptop, 
um, and not really access to, to more computing power. Um, there, there's other options, and one of these is Amazon's hardware, and that's where we set up the assembly on our local machine, you know, it could be our laptop, and we use a really nice high-speed encrypted um, cloud data drive that DNA Star developed. So it can uh, zip the files up, send them up to Amazon's cloud very quickly, and you can essentially set the assembly up on your local computer, almost identically to the way that you would set it up when you run a local assembly. So it's very convenient. You can say, I want to run uh, one assembly, or I want to run a bunch of assemblies all at one time, because we basically have unlimited uh, Amazon computing. So if I want to run 20 assemblies at one time and get the results back quickly, I can do them up in the cloud and then download them again very quickly and do my analysis locally. So and I'll show you what that looks like, that, that interface. So it's really, really handy if you don't have hardware, um, if you want to do a lot of jobs at one time, or if you want to collaborate and have data up in one central location and access it from different computers. So it's a lot, lot of advantages to the cloud. Um, another aspect of our software is the support uh, that we provide. And if you visit our website, you'll see that there's a number of training and support videos. Um, many of them are specific to um, NGS workflows, and they can be you know, Ion Torrent or PacBio or Illumina specific workflows. Uh, and they're typically a few minutes long. So these are great resources. And there's over 200 videos that we have all together. And, and they're great resources for figuring out um, how to do specific um, tasks in our software. Uh, we also do webinars like we are today. Um, and so these webinars are, are held about once a month. And uh, they, they range anywhere from NGS topics to protein analysis to our basic uh, molecular biology tools. Uh, we have them, um, uh, actually we have, we have them organized a little bit different way. I'll, I'll actually show you the website a little bit later. Um, but we have all different workflows on microbial genome analysis as well. So if I don't go into enough detail today, say on gap closure, we have a whole hour devoted uh, to gap closure webinars on our website. So one of the first uh, questions that will come up uh, regarding desktop type software, you know, so most of our software is still run on a desktop computer, and whereas many of the open source kind of competitors will run on Linux clusters, and and so um, we like to, I like to show some of the um, benchmark speeds just to give you an idea of how fast our software is, and that that it's really optimized for, you know, running and, and taking advantage of everything that's available on you know a modest computer. So. This is an alignment to a reference genome, and in this, if we pick a human genome, 1.2 billion reads, uh, we can do this assembly and all the SNP analysis and building all the output files in about 12 hours. And this time is actually going to drop now with the next release. It's going to be under 12 hours. Smaller data sets like exomes or panels you know, might be measured in one or two hours or minutes. Uh, microbial genomes, E. coli genomes, just a few minutes to do uh, the, the assembly. De novo assemblies, of course, will, will, will take longer because you don't have a reference to guide the, the mapper. And we usually don't want to assess de novo assemblies so much in speed, but rather in terms of accuracy. And those are some of the things that we'll look at in detail in the software you know, for, for that de novo assembly. Um, the accuracy for templated assemblies, um, these are you know, 99.7, 99.8% in those ranges. Um, we've had a focus at DNA Star lately to really get the accuracy as high as we can. And there, there's a paper um, on our website that compares our assembly and SNP caller with the BWA GATK, which is kind of a standard that Illumina uses. And we can show that we can, we're not only a lot faster, but we're more accurate than you know the, the best open source software that's out there. So today we'll be talking about um, the LaserGene genomic suite. And so that's a, num uh, a few different pieces of software. We'll have our assembler software and then a couple different analysis tools in SeekMan and in ArrayStar um, that do different things. Um, there's also other packages at DNA Star that include structural biology and evolution suite and our NovaFold uh, structure prediction software. So we do have a number of different packages. All of them together, we just call our DNA Star you know, LaserGene package. And so I, I won't focus too much on individual applications, but just to be aware, there's multiple different applications that focus on different things. 
So the workflows um, that we cover with NGS are wide ranging, and I have a few highlighted here that we're going to cover today. Um, it includes de novo genome, and then I added a sub workflow, which is kind of a hybrid de novo templated workflow that does some automated bacterial genome closure. And so uh, I won't go into that. Into, I'll, I'll show a slide that kind of explains what that does, but I won't go in the workflow in too much detail. Um, genome resequencing, so again, aligning data to a genome reference and uh, doing variant analysis, and I can show you we can do that with multiple genomes at one time and have some really nice tools for setting up the assembly and doing the downstream analysis. And then at an even larger scale, a metagenome um, uh, analysis, and that's aligning sequence data to a whole database of microbial genomes. And, and of course, there are going to be different ways that you do that. The example that I have today will be just aligning a cow gut metagenomic data set with unknowns in it to align it to figure out what's in that sample. And of course, there are other workflows, panels and exomes, RNA-seq, de novo transcriptome, uh, microRNA, um, and you know, ChIP-seq. So there's many different workflows that our software can support. So if you're not only doing microbial genome analysis, but these other workflows, uh, DNA star can be a, a great uh, choice for you. So we'll start here at the Novo Genome. And with the Novo Genome, I have a, just a couple slides before we get started, and then we'll pretty much focus on software. So um, just to be clear with some of the terminology, um, the Novo Genome, when we, when we run the, the algorithm and cluster sequences together, those sequence clusters are called contigs. And the contigs then, um, when you do that first de novo assembly, are kind of free-floating. The, the, the assembler couldn't put the whole genome together, um, and it didn't know what their proper order was. And so there are ways to do that, and one of those ways is mate pair data. And mate pair data, separated by gaps, can, can be used to put the contigs into an order, and that those ordered contigs then are called scaffolds. And so, it's a, so the scaffolds that are not synonymous, they, are, they contain more than one contig, and they have those contigs in the proper order. Um, the best de novo assemblies of Illumina data will yield less than 100 contigs. In some cases, it can be a dozen contigs or so, depending on the genome. Um, you know, rarely is it that does Illumina data assemble in, into one contig. And so there usually is some work that needs to be done to close gaps. Now, if you have PAC bio data, much longer reads, you might be able to get an assembly that yields one contig or just maybe just a handful of contigs. Either way, it, there's still work that needs to be done then to take those contigs, get them in the right order, and then resolve, do the gap closure, and figure out what that sequence is between those gaps. And, and that's where DNA Star software really excels. Um, it allows you to identify Organize the projects, you can visualize the scaffolds, figure out the areas that are problematic, and then resolve them. So one of the questions is, you know, well, why is um, scaffolding important? In, 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 in particular, why is auto scaffolding, uh, contig scaffolding important? Um, and again, when you have even 25 contigs, um, you can manually figure that out, you know, blast the ends and kind of slug through it and figure out what that order is. But it's really nice to have an algorithm that can read mate pair data, for instance, and just automatically create a scaffold for you. And that really uh, uh, speeds up the workflow and uh, allows you to, to close off genomes more efficiently. So just to give an idea, uh, you know, so, I, so I had these kind of simple schematics of um, what happens in a typical de novo assembly is that um, in a de novo assembly, um, your, the, what, what, what limits um, the number of contigs is the read length in relation to the longest repetitive element that's in that genome. And so, for example, in E. coli, there's typically many different repeat regions that are about a, a 1.5 kb to a kb, you know, transpose on elements. Um, that are repetitive throughout the, the, the genome. And there could be, you know, 25, there could be 100 copies of, of these elements. And there's also ribosomal operons that are going to be about 8 kb in that range. And so without reads that are longer than those repetitive elements, um, a contig will assemble, hit the repeat region, and then stop because a read cannot be placed uniquely or accurately in that region. So um, 
typical data, like fragment single end data, or paired end where the pairs are close together, cannot span across the repeat. And so that's where the contig1 ends, and then contig2, will, where it hits in the, the novel region, will cluster on the other side. So it kind of leaves you in this situation, if you don't have mate pair or long reads, really difficult to close off the genome. You're kind of stuck at this point. Um, and so if you have long read data um, or mate pair data that can span across that repetitive element, then you, you have a couple different options. You can use an algorithm that can read the, the mate pair data, which is in our um, Seekman software, that can at least put contig1 next to 2 so we can focus on this, this gap, get them in the right order. Or you can have a long read that spans across the whole region, then use the assembler to piece things together. And customers do both, you know, take both approaches. Um, they may take, you know, add a Sanger read to close a gap off. They may take a pack bio read to close a gap off. So you need one of the two to get that um, genome in the proper order. Now there is another kind of a third option, and that's uh, a hybrid approach. So um, if you have a reference genome that's closely related to what you've sequenced and you have paired data, um, you can use our automated genome closure workflow. And that what that does is um, you, you align to the genome template, and then when you hit a, there's a novel region, the algorithm will automatically recognize, oh, there's an insertion here. There's something novel in the sequence strain. It recognizes that. It breaks the template into two pieces. And then it takes that mate pair data and it clusters all those mate pairs that fall into the gap region, into that insertion element. And if you have enough coverage of mate pair data, um, there's enough data here in this novel region that can cluster together into a contig. And so it just does that automatically. It finds deletions, insertions, splits the genome template, loads in, uses the pair information to identify what falls into the insertion, and then it de novo assembles it. And you can see then you can stitch together across the gap. And that works really well if you've got enough mate pair data and your, your, your reference genome is closely related. Um, if it's too different, then there may be too many genomic changes um, where this uh, ends up not being the best approach, then maybe a de novo approach becomes the best approach. So, so it's kind of a third option for working with the genomes. So at this point, let's jump out of PowerPoint and go into the software a bit here. So our starting point then will be Seekman Engine. And Seekman Engine is um, a 64-bit program. It is our only program that runs on, on uh, Linux, um, although I, I should say our, our protein folding can also also run on Linux, um, but as part of this genomic suite, um, you do have a Linux option. So if that's, for example, if you're doing a large de novo assembly and your only big uh, de novo computer is a Linux computer, um, you can run the assembly there. Um, we typically start by creating a new project, and that will start a local assembly on this uh, computer. I can also say, well, I'd really like to run, you know, my assembly up on the cloud. You know, maybe you've got some big data sets or your hardware isn't up to the task. So the cloud assembly, you just click this option, enter your credentials, and then everything is essentially the same. There will be an uploader that sends your data up, um, and everything will look uh, essentially the same as when we run this local assembly. So I'm going to choose the project type, and you can see there's different workflows here. Um, ex exome genome, um, different panels, transcriptomes, chip seek, metagenomics, viral, and host integration. So we pick the appropriate workflow. And with genome, there's more options. So it's kind of a decision tree as we go through this wizard to set up the project. And with genome, we've got um, de novo assembly. I can run a templated with or without a control. Here's our automated reference guided with the automated gap closure that I mentioned in the slide. Um, and then we have kind of a, an archived workflow um, that, that has some special um, 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 aspects to it that allow us in certain workflows to um, do some gap closures. So, so we've got lots of different options here. We'll just we'll stick with the de novo here to start with. And this will be an E. coli, so I just name the project here pick the output folder, um, I can save my project in multiple different formats. I have a Seekman Pro format that is completely editable, 
So that means I can edit um, contigs, I can split them, merge them, order them, create scaffolds. I can also make micro edits, make micro edits to the consensus to the individual line bases. Um, because it's fully editable and all those edit points, there is a limit to the project size, and that's about 10 million reads, which is more than enough for microbial genomes. If you're doing larger genomes, small eukaryotes, you're going to run into that limit. Um, and then you have to consider things like maybe a chromosome by chromosome approach or use longer read technology where you don't hit the limit as quickly. Um, if you have a much larger data set, we also have a BAM file output option. And the BAM file does not have a read limit. It can be a gigantic file, but it's not editable. So you can look at the data, um, you can export consensi, but you can't make the micro edits in the data. And then we can save reports and contigs and unassembled reads, some different output options. At this point, we pick the read technology, and so you can see the different platforms. And as we pick the different platforms, that really starts to set the optimal parameters for that particular um, sequence type. And so with Illumina data, um, it will have different default parameters than ion torrent data. So it has a different error profile, read length, and so forth. So I'm going to pick Illumina data and paired reads. And this is some Illumina data. Um, it's Nextera mate pair data. And the insert size or the distance between the forward and reverse pairs is about 5,000 base pairs. Um, this is data that was downloaded from Illumina base space, so it is publicly available data to try out. Um, this is where I can limit input reads if needed, um, and there's all different trimming options. And so by default, the engine will do a quality trim, um, but there's other options. So depending on where your data comes from, you may have vectors, adapt adapters, linkers, primers that need trimming on the data. Um, it's, it's not so common with, with genomic data sets. Um, it does, does happen on occasion. Um, transcriptomic data sets oftentimes have lots of different linkers and adapters. Um, and so what I always recommend is, this is, is if you have a de novo data set that you're having some troubles with, it doesn't want to assemble quickly, it's using too much RAM, I always say run a pilot. Just assemble 100,000 reads. Get something that finishes in just a couple of you know a couple of minutes. Then take a look at the data and see is there some identifiable um, linker present in the data that you need to trim off. And so that little pilot run can be very helpful. And there's a whole set of parameters here um, that we can use to fine tune. We can change the quality trimming. We can do a fixed end trim. Um, we can remove the small reads. So some data sets are full of little short pieces that um, so we can say don't you know add anything more shorter than 75 base pairs um, trim to MERS a quality score independent so lots of different trimming options um, for data sets which is really important for de novo in particular the data needs to be as clean as possible to give you the best possible result so it's worth taking the time to experiment with different trimming now of course this data came down from base space it's been cleaned up it's it's data that they, they you know uh, it has already been processed, so it's nice and clean, except for a little quality trimming. Um, so now we have some options here. We enter in the genome length. And I always want to check that to make sure that I have the right size. Um, the genome length gives the de novo algorithm a chance to do repeat handling and identify areas that are overrepresented in the data set. So it's important to have that fairly close. If you don't know the exact size, you know, give it the best guess. Uh, it'll help the algorithm identify those repetitive elements. Uh, there's also a minimum match percentage, and this is probably the single most impactful parameter for a de novo assembly, and that is the percent that the reads in a contig must match the consensus for that contig in order to align there. And of course, the higher I make this number, the more stringent the assembly is. So if I set it at 97, I get a very stringent assembly. The end result is I'll have probably smaller contigs, but they may be more accurate. So there's sort of a trade-off here. If I make this too low, 80%, I'll get really big contigs, uh, but there's probably going to be errors in them. And those errors, um, for, for some workflows, in some softwares, um, you don't know there's an error there. You, you just start trying to close the genome. Things don't go together. You can't visualize it. In our software, you can actually take a look at the data 
And so if there are errors there, we can correct them downstream a little bit. Um, and so the default was set for 93, which is a nice balance between the most accurate contigs and largest. But if I drop this to 90 um, and lower the stringency, I can introduce a couple of, of what, what we call false joins in the contig. So this is where I'm going to assemble so I can demonstrate a little bit of the, some of the uh, uh, editing tools. So we'll reduce that stringency a tad. Um, I can also call out small contigs. Um, it's not uncommon to say, I'm not going to analyze contigs that are less than 250 base pairs long. I just want to see the bigger contigs, um, and hopefully that will allow the assembly to go together more smoothly and not save out a lot of the, the junk. Um, there's also advanced options. I won't go through all these in detail, but um, the help is contextual. So if you do have questions about what different parameters do, just click the help button and you can see everything in that window is defined here with links to additional um, help. So after setting up the assembly, um, we're ready to begin. And what's actually happening is that this is a wizard that sets up a script. And it's the script that gives the instructions to the assembler um, for what it's supposed to do. And you can see that there are, you know, the project kind, the workflow kind, the sequence data that we're loading, and then all the parameters. I can actually show all of them if you really want to see under the hood. That's all the parameters, a whole bunch of different things. And so it's very common um, for, for technical support, if you're having a problem, um, we often say, well, send us your script file. You know, save this script file out email that to us, we'll look through it and see if there's a problem in the script. Um, and then once you're ready to go, you click assemble. Again, if there's a problem here, uh, if you see lots of red error messages streaming through this log, you can export the log. Again, send that to the DNA star. Um, the log is interesting to watch. It shows you, know, it shows you the progression. Um, and at some point, it'll scan these sequences, and then we'll start clustering sequences into contigs. So we're finding MERS. So in a de novo assembly, I always recommend sitting around a little while and watching like this. And the de novo assembler is called SNG. And I'm watching the RAM usage. This is a RAM-dependent algorithm. And I've got 32 gigs of RAM on this computer. If I come back in an hour and I see that all 32 gigs are being occupied by this small assembly, there's probably something wrong, you know, typically it's either wrong with the script or wrong with the data. It's usually a data issue. So you don't want to let these assemblies run for three or four days. They should be done for a microbe in an hour or two maximum. And if it's longer than that, stop the assembly, contact DNA Star, and we'll figure out what, what the problem is. Uh, another, another thing that you can see is in this log as it's assembling, um, typically you may have at, at the, at the peak of number of contigs, you might have 500 contigs or something in memory as it's trying to sort out all the different combinations. Uh, but if you've got 5,000 or 50,000 contigs or 100,000 contigs, that's also an indication that the data is not assembling well. There's something preventing it from going together. So if you see a huge number of contigs here and a lot of RAM usage, stop the assembly, run that pilot run, and, and, and DNA Star can help you figure out what what, what's going on with the, the project. So now when this is done, there's a, a, a button that you can click Next, and it'll be a report that gives us the output for that assembly. And then we can also automatically launch the project in Seekman Pro. And Seekman Pro then is where we'll go next to look at, uh, look at the assembled data. So I'm going to actually stop this assembly. Hey, Matt, before we move on to Seekman Pro, sure. we did have one question about someone working um, actually with viral genomes. So they're wondering about um, what types of minimum lengths you would set for those. Um, so, yeah, so viral genomes or plasmids or, you know, anything that's smaller, um, yeah, you can you just, just adjust the genome size accordingly. So if it's a 10,000 base pair virus, just set a 10,000 base pair genome length. Um, now, with viruses, the one thing to keep in mind with viruses is that you might have enough data to get a million X coverage. I've seen data sets where it's really extreme. And so you have to keep that in mind that in a de novo assembly, the optimal coverage is typically around 100, maybe 150 X coverage. And that'll give you the best kind of de novo result. When you start going much higher, you know, 250 to 500, 
um, the assembly will slow down and start to use more and more RAM. So when doing viral assemblies in particular, you might want to limit that input data to try to target, you know, no more than probably 250x coverage. Um, and, and you should get a, a really nice result. And then oftentimes a virus will assemble into that one contig. Perfect. Thanks, Matt. Okay, let's see here. I've got, I'll open the project here. Okay, so here's the assemble project. It will have two windows that will be open. Um, we'll get the uh, report file and then the list of contigs. And the report file will tell us things like version and assembly time. So this one took, you know, about 18 minutes long. And then we get things like the number of contigs and how many contigs it'll take to reach the genome size. So that's kind of a key metric. So here it's, you know, about 50 contigs um, in this project, and we need to stitch them together to get our, our complete genome. Um, the contig in 50 is 237 kilobases, so that's the contig size that represents um, where half the data is. So generally, the larger that number is, that means the better your assembly was. So, you know, if this was 23 kilobases, that would mean that a whole lot of data is in relatively small contig. So um, this is a great number to look at, but it's not the only number. Um, you know, this number does not mean very much if there's lots of errors in the contigs. It just means you have lots of big contigs with errors in them. Um, so you need a mechanism then to determine, you know, are these contigs accurate or not? Now, I purposely assembled this one at a little bit lower match percentage to try to introduce a couple of errors um, that we can go and identify and correct. Um, so we get all these kind of, there's our script information from the report, and here's our list of contigs. I'll sort them by length just to show you that we've got, you know, a couple contigs that are 400,000 base pairs. So, you know, really nice assembly um, by contig size. Uh, and so usually what I do is I'll double click and you can take a look at the aligned data. All right, so here's the data. But I usually want to go and see, try to assess how accurate these contigs are. And I'm going to go through here and just select this top range of contigs and go to a different view called the strategy view. And this will pop a bunch of windows up. And what I'm looking at here is a couple things. So here's a contig, and I see the depth of coverage. You know, it's around, we'll call it 50x, and it's across this contig. And we have pair consistency. And that's a plot for how deep we have consistent pairs across the contig. So if the contig is accurate, you should have pair consistency depth across it. And this graph is built by the arrows that are down at the bottom. So if I go to custom, so the, the green pairs that are pairs that are mate pairs in the contig, the right distance apart, pointing at each other, and that's these green arrows here. So I can zoom in, hover over them, so you can see that they, you know, they range, there's some here, this one's 2,000 apart, here's one that's about 5,000 typical for mate pair data. So when I look at a contig like this, the fact that there's this mate pair data across the whole contig makes me very confident that that contig is accurate. And so I can quickly look at a strategy view and say, these are accurate. You'll get little deeper pileups at some repetitive elements. A little bit of raggedness at the ends is okay. That's all typical. So I can go through pretty quick and see you can see here it kind of tails off a little bit. It's a little bit thinner. I might come back and look at that, but that's not too concerning yet. And I don't even have to zoom in too much. So these contigs look good. And so I can quickly assess the quality here before I do the next step. And I know there's some errors up here. It's not right in these little contigs. Well, they're not that little. It's 140,000 there. There's what I'm looking for. So we can see it pops out, pair consistency. It drops right in the middle of this contig. And if I zoom in, there is some pair coverage across that region, but it's not nearly as deep as the flanking regions. All right, so I'd look at that. I'm just going to double click, and it brings me right to that point. And I can see that's pretty thin there. And, and I can also now look at some of these other kind of pairs, like the red and yellow, which are the inconsistent, that just says, and I can see the yellow, which means 
there's something inconsistent here. And it gives me a number, it says 39. What that means is that for this read, it mapped here, but its mate pair is on contig 39, a different contig. So that strongly suggests to me that that could be a false join there. So I can just say, well, I don't trust it. I am going to just split it. So I do a contig edit. So I can split right there at the insertion point. So there's the first macro edit. And I can let the software now decide how to order these contigs. And that's another little piece of information from the mate pair. We get these blue pairs. They're at the end of the contig and they have a number. And that is, this is contig 41. And you see all these blue, if I zoom in enough, arrows going to 26 or 21. What that means is that these mate pairs are on another contig to the left. And it's either contig 26 or 21. Mate pair distance is 5 KB. We could have a couple contigs sandwiched in between. It's very common. If I go to the other end of the contig, we got a lot of evidence that contig 14 is on the right side. And so that's the information that the algorithm will use to put these contigs in the order. There's another contig where you see that dip. And I'm just going to play it safe and say, well, even though there's some data that assembles, if it's a repetitive element, um, I'm not going to trust it. I'm just going to split that. and let the algorithm figure it out later. There's one of two, two areas. So there's a big 300,000 base pair contig. So of course, the bigger the contig, the more likely there is to have, be a area like this. Actually, I'm gonna go and quit that end off first. So this is what's nice about Seekman is it's very easy to do this. I don't have to Just going right through here and making these edits. I think there's one more and we can be done with this. Now, I will tell you that I took this data set. I didn't show this part of it, but I took the same data set um, and tried to scaffold it. And I saw that I got three scaffolds. And that was with these kind of errors. That means false joins will lead to false scaffolds. So you definitely want to have some editing capability before you start ordering contigs. It's easier to do this than it is to try to fix scaffolds that have many. Here's our biggest contig. That looks good. It's almost 450 KB. All right, so we did some editing there. So now I'm just going to select these contigs and run our algorithm, which is called order contigs. And so this is reading those blue arrows that I showed you that links contigs that are upstream or downstream and, and builds them into a scaffold. Almost done here. So if we look at the right-hand side, oh, I missed one. So almost got them in one. So we have scaffold 100, scaffold 110. And you can see if I double click on the scaffold, it will open that entire scaffold now in the strategy view. And I can look at these blue pairs as well and the blue pairs show me all the mate pairs that were used to create the scaffold. Like that. And you can see it between contig 20 and 50, all this mate pair data supports that ordering. And so I can, I'm just kind of moving to the right here to see how big the scaffold is. Say, oh, we're not quite at E. coli length, we're at 3.34. And so I would go back and look. And what happened here is I missed, I went through those a little bit too quickly and I missed one of my edits. So what I would do is go back and edit the content again and run that again and get these to go together into one scaffold. 
once they're in scaffolds though, and, and sometimes you, you're stuck with two scaffolds, if you have a repetitive element that is, again, larger than your longest read or your uh, longest mate pair, you will have more than one scaffold for your genome. Uh, we can also run additional algorithms then that looks for overlap across these repetitive elements, uh, and it's called align scaffolds and contig end to end. Um, so I can run, I, I won't run it right now, but you run that, it'll look for some uh, match. At that point, when you run that algorithm, then it becomes a process of gap closure. And the gap closure, again, I have a webinar devoted to that, but um, I can add new sequence into the project. It can be, it could be Sanger data, it could be a pack bio read, you know, some other sequence data, we can pull it into the project and splice it in between contig. So I could say, I'm gonna focus on the gap between eight, contig eight and four, bring in that piece, import it in and align it and start to close the gaps off. And that goes through a whole series of steps then depending on what your workflow is for closing off that genome. Okay, so let's uh, switch gears a little bit. I'm gonna go back to our SeekMan engine and move on to the next workflow here. So that was the Novo assembly. Now I'm gonna just show you a genome assembly templated. And these are some mycobacterium strains. And I can pick an output folder. And now I'm aligning to a template. So um, the temporary file location, that's the scratch disk. It's asking me, where do you wanna process those temp files? For a microbe, you might not need a dedicated scratch disk. If I have 100 strains though, that's a lot more data. I may wanna have my dedicated one terabyte drive to do that. Or if I'm aligning to you know, even larger genomes, you'll wanna pay more attention to that. But the best performance is if you have a dedicated hard drive for handling those files. So we can add the template file. I'm gonna pick a, a GenBank annotated file here. Um, I can also pick a VCF file. So if you have a file that contains um, interesting variants, so these are you know variations that you say you know are in the reference strain, and you may wanna compare your samples. Do I have variations at these locations or not with these other strains? Um, the VCF is a um, ubiquitous format you can load the VCF file as well. Um, you can also create the VCF file. If you don't have one right now, do your alignment in DNA Star software, find the interesting variants and save out the VCF file. So again, I'm gonna pick uh, my Illumina data. Um, this is data for three different strains. It's paired data. And now I tell the assembler, this is multiple sample. And it asks me, what is each experiment? So we'll call that strain one. Let's give it some name here. So these two pair files go together. So three samples here. So you have to assign the name. And what's gonna happen now Actually, I have two options. I can assemble all three strains together in one project and look at them together. Or I can say, I've got 100 strains. I can't really look at all of them in one project. It's, it'll be too deep and cumbersome. Um, save them out in 100 separate projects. So either way, I can still compare them in DNA Star software. Um, a general rule of thumb is that if you've got you know five or less genomes, you can do it in one project. If you have more, then I would probably save them out separately. Um, this is a haploid SNP analysis. Um, fewer, there's fewer parameters for template guided than de novo. So I just stick with defaults and let it go. When it's done, I can open this up in SeekMan Pro again. And so here is my assembly. See, there's one contig. It is the reference contig and each strain now is represented by this twisty triangle. So I can see two strains, at least at the start of my template here. And so I can look at data for two different strains together. I hold control alt down, I can collapse or expand. All right, I can see the annotations in the reference sequence. 
Um, typically, though, I want to do SNP analysis. And so I want to find variations of interest. And so there's different filters applied. So for example, I can say, I had a VCF file. Show me the SNPs that correlate to those positions in that VCF file only. Um, and I could say, only show me the non-synonymous SNPs that are in that VCF file at certain depths or percentages. So now I have a list of those variations after applying the filters um, that are in, I can see what strain it is from the MID column. I can see the reference position, the type, the base, the called base, the impact on the protein, the SNP percent. So I'm just scrolling right here. The user ID, which is the number in the VCF file, the feature type, DNA change, amino acid change. So you get all this information about the SNP and it's interactive. So if I want to look at the SNP, I can double click, go to that point in the assembly, expand. You know, it's a great interface for SNP verification. So another thing I can do is say, well, I'm really interested in what's new. Show me the novel SNPs only. So here's the list of novel SNPs. And I might say, let's make this a little more stringent. You know, I want these to be non-synonymous, good depth, peanut ref of 99 probability. Right? There's 211 SNPs that meet that criteria. So I could say, well, I'm going to look at all of them and maybe just my genes of interest. Say, that's an interesting SNP. So how do I record it? I check this box, right click, and I can say append this check SNP to my VCF file. So now I've added that new SNP to my VCF file to keep a record of it. So this is a great way to interrogate and validate SNPs you know, in the assembly and to do some comparisons. Now, if I want to find, for example, SNPs, you know, and do genome-wide kind of comparisons, you know, maybe I've got more genomes than this, or I want to see groups or gene-level comparisons, we can also do that analysis in our ArrayStar software. And so let me just launch ArrayStar here. So ArrayStar allows us to compare bioinformatic data between, for variations, copy numbers, RNA-seq. Um, it has quantitators built in it for RNA-seq, variant analysis tools. So I can bring in that SeqMan engine output file for these three strains. and pull them into a ray star. And it'll ask me, do I want gene regions, whole genome? Let's do whole genome here. So now it's pulling in these three strains. And what's it, nice about this is now I get a kind of a summary. I can look at this SNP table. And you can see here's at each reference position, I get my gene name, the called sequence. And then in each strain, I can see, you know, is it, um, a SNP or not a SNP. And because these are what I have filtered here are for, um, by default, it'll go to the SNPs in the VCF file. Um, our software also writes down if there wasn't a variant observed, you know, so it, it, rather than just an empty cell, it says there was no change in strain 408 at this position. We had it, a, uh, it's colored red, so we had it a non synonymous chain and change in 2397. And we had a um, uh, a no change in 970. So I can get this summary then across multiple strains, multiple genomes in this SNP table. So it's a, it's a great way to do comparative analysis, you know, at the SNP level. I also have additional filtering I can do. So I could say, you know, let's start creating some filters. And so I can create different SNP sets. And again, we go into detail. There's other uh, webinars and videos about how to use these filters. But I can do a gene level or a SNP level analysis and create gene sets or SNP sets in ArrayStar. So it's a great tool, again, for making those kind of comparisons. OK, so, so lastly, I'd like to show you one other uh, workflow um, before we finish up here. And so I'm going to go and do a metagenomic workflow. So that was three genomes that we compared. But what if I have a mixed sample and I want to sort through it? I can pick the um, metagenomic workflow. We'll do a templated. And so this is some cow um, 
microbiome. So pretty common for an environmental sample where it's an unknown mixture and you want to figure out what's, what's in that sample. All right, so we're going to pick the biome genome. So what are we going to align against? Um, I don't have it in my local folder, so I'm going to jump up to my network. And so our reference genomes, online database, and here's some microbial genome databases. So I could load that whole folder of annotated genomes um, or just these FASTA files. And again, these were downloaded from NCBI, so it's several thousand bacterial genomes. Then I input my sequence data. And let's see here. And I've got some. Here, we'll just load in a couple files here just for demo purposes. So I can load in um, unpaired data typically, and it could be two files, it could be a hundred files. All right. And now the difference here between, so everything is the same up to this point. The minimum match percentage is set to 99. And the idea here is that the database likely will have many similar organisms in it, where areas are 100% identical or close to it. So the algorithm has to figure out and try to place very stringently the reads to the appropriate genome. And in some cases, it matches perfectly well, and it will it is allowed to map to both genomes in that case. So there's some different parameters where the read placement for repeats is place all, whereas with the genome, it's place once. So it's a fundamentally kind of different way that the algorithm will work. Um, now when it's ready to assemble, again, we're going to align to all those FASTA sequences. Right? This assembly will take longer. It's a, it's a much larger assembly, and it may need two to four terabytes of disk space. So if you're doing this sort of work, keep that in mind. Um, when it's done, there's a couple different output options. One is a tad delimited ex, uh, file that you can open in Excel. And so I have this one open in Excel. I can see my template IDs and the title. So I get the name of the organism. And so I can see all the different organisms and I get some bacterioides, which are common in, in cow gut. I get the template length the number of sequences that have aligned to that template. I get um, the number of bases that have no coverage at all, and the percent of the template that's covered and the median coverage. And so what this is telling me is I can get an idea based on these metrics of what's most abundant in that sample, right? So it's, it's a nice kind of way to get you know, some output. Now, because the templates vary in size, um, it's this is not a absolute quantitation. It's just kind of a rough idea of what, what's in the sample. I can also um, take this data and feed it through our ArrayStar software. And so ArrayStar, as I pointed out, does things like RNA-seq and copy number. And I can feed it through those workflows and quantitate and normalize the read counts by the genome lengths and get an RPKM value, a log value that I can then compare. And so I can, again, go to ArrayStar. And I've already loaded this project, but I same thing as I did with the SNP project, I load these in. I have three samples of uh, uh, different metagenomic samples. And so I get a gene table then, you know, of all the organisms. And I can see for each sample now, there's a normalized log to essentially ex expression value, but it's a, really a count. And so I can see I have different values here. And now if I want to compare them, I can do things and get some nice visuals like um, a heat map, for instance. So the heat map now, you know, I have sample one, two, three in the columns. So I could compare organism or compare data sets to see, you know, does the pattern look similar or dissimilar from each other? So I can get a really nice picture that way on a large number of data points. Heat map, we also have things like scatter plots. So I can see how correlated um, multiple different samples are. You know, does one individual, does the, the, the biome, um, differ a lot from one individual to the next. So again, ArrayStar has lots of different visualizations um, that, that can make this uh, analysis more interesting.
Okay, well, I know I went through a, a lot of workflows there, and I'd be more than happy to field any questions uh, from anybody. And again, thank you for your time today, and I'll stick around here for a few minutes to answer any questions. Sounds great. Thanks, Matt. Um, again, if you want to chat in some last questions here at the webinar, uh, we'll try and fit those in. Uh, if you think of questions later, you can also email those to me at webinars at dnastar.com. Uh, also, feel free to email me with ideas for future webinar topics as well. Uh, additionally, if anyone will be attending the ASM meeting down in New Orleans in the next couple weeks, I'd encourage you to stop by and visit us at booth number 711, uh, and you can learn uh, more from myself and uh, my colleague Brian Anderson about uh, our software and, and microbial discussions as well. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you found the webinar helpful. I'll be sending out a recording of the webinar in the next day or so if you'd like to go back and refer to today's presentation. And as Matt mentioned, we also have a large collection of videos and other webinar recordings on our website, so I'd encourage you to check those out when you have some time. Uh, thanks again for joining us, everyone, and have a great day.